And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's trying that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is Friday. Thank you, Greta, for your usual introduction. And you know what? This is going to be a somewhat different climate change roundtable, number 55 in a series. We're going to do something a little bit, well, offbeat. We're going to bracket the racket, so to speak, you know, the climate racket. Um, and because this is the beginning of March Madness, so we've kind of applied a basketball theme to this. And we'll try not to drool, I mean, dribble during the process. But we are going to have a lot of fun, and it's going to be a little different. Now, the cool thing is about this particular show, you viewers will be able to vote in comments to help with the bracketing and determine the winner of the most ridiculous climate myth. So that's what you're going to vote for in this bracketing, the most ridiculous myth. With us today, we have our usual crew of uh, Linnea and Sterling. And of course, we have Jim Lakely, who is Vice President of Communications and All Things Sports at the Heartland Institute. Uh, welcome all of you today, and uh, thank you viewers for joining us. So, Jim, you're going to be telling us a little bit about how this bracketing system works. Uh, mm -hmm. So why don't you take it away and let us know? Yeah. Um, so if people don't like this idea, including uh, uh, you regular people on the Climate Change Roundtable show, Linnea Sterling and Anthony, if you don't like this, this is all my fault. Uh, this is my idea. I impose this upon the show, uh, pulling rank as vice president of the Heartland Institute. So uh, I will take full responsibility if this is a big bomb. But uh, the idea, of course, with March Madness upon us is to look at some of these climate myths. And it's a great opportunity to talk about some of the things about the climate and the myths about the climate that are pushed in the mainstream media that are absorbed and considered truth by a lot of people in the United States and around the world. And we are going to go through these and they're seated like the NCAA tournament. And uh, we will eventually get to the end from the sweet 16. We are, we are not going to do 64 myths, although there are probably more than that, Anthony, the 64 myths that we would have to correct because this is not a five hour show. It's only a one hour show. So we, uh, we started with the sweet 16. We'll get uh, through to the elite eight, the final four, and then we will determine what is the biggest, perhaps most annoying, most persistent myth in the climate uh, world as we, as we get in the media. All right. Uh, so How with that, dare you? I know. <laughs> Greta, uh, if you're there, if you're out there, Greta, and uh, you know you're watching, uh, welcome. Uh, I think you might enjoy this if you have any yes. sense of humor. All right. So uh, let, let's get started. So uh, our number one seed, I seeded all of these. Uh, I think I did a pretty decent job. Number one seed is uh, the consensus, the climate consensus that 97% of scientists believe that humans are causing a climate catastrophe and we must do something to stop it. Up against the number 16 seed, the idea that honeybees are uh, endangered, again, because of human activity, and that that will cause a different kind of climate catastrophe, certainly among our uh, agricultural community. So, uh, uh, Anthony, as you uh, being the usual host of this show, why don't you talk a little bit about the consensus myth? Okay. Well, I can talk about both of them, actually. But, yeah, you know, the 97% the consensus myth is a statistical... Now, I'm not going to be kind. It's garbage. It really is. It's put together by this former cartoonist, John Cook, who started this website up called Skeptical Science, which was uh, named basically just to poke at us true climate realists and skeptics. Anyway, so he's went out and looked at a bunch of different articles, publications, and peer-reviewed research, um, and tried to bracket them in his way, so to speak, and came up with this 97% number. Well, when you actually dig into his methodology and the actual amount of uh, numbers involved, it, it turned out that there's only like 72 papers out there that really said climate change is, you know, totally man-made driven and it's a catastrophe. 
And so the whole thing was basically just based on a few papers that, that came down to it. Most of the science papers out there talked about effects that could be possible. They talked about modeling. They talked about, you know, things, but they weren't definitive. They weren't saying absolutely positively. And so it that's was, what happened. No, it was worse than that. Um, he didn't read the papers, of course. There were thousands of them. He had, I think, three graduate students going through abstracts. They read abstracts. And if the word, the phrase in climate change appeared in that order, climate and change, they were counted as counting uh, as if it was anthropogenic climate change. It was necessarily human caused climate change. People who had their papers listed as counting uh, subsequently said, no, we didn't say that. Other papers didn't talk about climate change at all. What they talked about was, uh, you know, colder winters. They didn't link it to climate change. They were just talking about colder winters and looking at different factors that might be responsible, for example. And uh, they said, oh, no, that's climate change. Unless they specifically said in the abstract, you know, the evidence that humans are causing climate change is up for debate or uh, is not evidence in the data. Uh, it was not rejected. So that, that's how they come out with this 97%. Oreskes did a similar thing before that. And uh, even then, you know, the truth is, there is largely a consensus on a, a couple of points. Uh, you know, I, 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 I doubt that 3% of the people disagree that climate change is occurring. Do... Uh, more than 3% of the people disagree that humans might be playing a role with CO2. I know people who think that, but do 97% of the scientists think that humans might be playing a role? The question is catastrophe. Is it dangerous? Uh, and can we attribute more than 50% of it, which is what the IPCC said, to human activity? I think that's where the debate lies. On the other points, I think there is a consensus. Yep, well said, Sterling. All right, so we we got the honeybee myth next. You know, Einstein said, I believe it was Einstein, of course, that might be a myth itself, said that if honeybees disappeared, the earth is doomed. And so there's this idea in the eco community that, you know, honeybees are going to be threatened by human activity, blah, 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 and we're on our way out. And they keep talking about climate change affecting honeybees. But the bottom line is that when you actually go and look at this stuff, look at what's actually happening with honeybees, most of it has to do with a parasitic mite uh, problem that they've got with uh, honeybees and, and other issues associated with certain types of uh, insecticides and other things. But climate change isn't really proven to have any effect. Have you guys got any comments on that? Well, um, I had an interesting study that I read a couple of years ago that just kind of got me rolling um, where they were trying to uh, measure the effect of global warming on honeybee colonies. And so their methodology was to paint the um, bee boxes different colors. And they painted several of them black. And of course, that ended up being a major problem for the bees inside. There's a reason why you paint the boxes white. Um, yep. <laughs> they, they ended up roasting in there. You know, um, uh, yeah, I will have to say, I will have to say that when they paint the boxes black, it changes the albedo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh boy. that's terrible, Anthony. <laughs> Straight to jail for that one. Um, but, but so basically the bees didn't make it in the black boxes and what they incorrectly but roasted honey is from nice. That, yeah, it is. Um, what they what they incorrectly took from that was that climate change, specifically global warming, will kill the honeybees because they can't survive in high temperatures. Well, there's bees in a lot of countries that have, on average, higher temperatures than somewhere like the United States. Most of the honeybees that are in the United States are imports in the first place. Um, they were not necessarily here in the uh, the species that's common here. It's a European breed that's most common here. Um, and with the increasing number of the uh, Africanized bees as well. Um, so these, these animals are really adaptable. And that's been shown for as long as 
we've had them around. And the yeah, idea yeah. that, you know, you want to delete all of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which will impact photosynthesis, <laughs> um, and to say that that won't have a problem in, in the long run for honeybees is um, pretty, pretty spectacularly poor reasoning, in my opinion. Yeah, the, right. the Afri you know, the Africanized honeybees are, are a direct refutation of that. Most of them come from much warmer countries, right, around the right. equator. Um, and, you know, now I'd I like to say I didn't know Einstein said what you said he said. I, maybe he did. But, of course, even then it shows that the experts, he wasn't an expert in pollination because honeybees are a small part of the pollinating population. And we didn't even have them here in North America. And yet there were plenty of plants and trees and flowers in North America before we imported European honeybees. So um, the data just clearly shows honey is going, honey production is going up. Uh, honeybee colonies are, are uh, have had uh, taken big hits, but they're due to parasites and pesticides, maybe, uh, but not climate change. So uh I think that's just, that's not just a myth. That's a lie. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So round number one is done. <laughs> I think, I think we have to go with consensus over honeybees. I'm glad we got the honeybee conversation in here because they're not going to make it onto the next round. All oh, right. Yeah, I'm you. voting differently. You're going to vote. Wait. Okay. So we should do it. So you wait. vote for honeybees is the most annoying. I know uh, bees no, can as be a, annoying as, outside. as the most direct lie, because I think the consensus if you leave out catastrophe, I think there is a consensus. Once you add catastrophe, it goes away. All right. Anthony, so it depends you, on how you frame the question. But the so honeybee is just a lie. So Sterling's the only one who wants honeybees. Because I know. That Wait, the, are the, we the, getting an audience vote on this? Uh, the chat seems to be pretty heavy on consensus. So on I think consensus. we have to go with that. Yeah. So. All righty. All right. Okay. Excellent. So All round right. two, extreme weather versus wheat yields. Yes. Uh, Sterling is our resident agricultural expert. I'm sure you can quote something from the FAO about wheat yields, right? Well, off the top of my head, I can't quote it. I can just say that we know that not just wheat yields, but all plant yields, well, maybe not all, there may be some that have declined, but all the major cereal crops are increasing. They're increasing in yield. They're increasing in absolute production number. Uh, in some places where wheat has declined, it's because they switched to other crops. You know, look, we, uh, uh, we, we switched a lot from wheat to corn here once the government started subsidizing ethanol. So it's like, oh, wheat declined. Well, yeah, because if you're paying people to grow corn, they'll grow corn instead. You can grow a lot of things on the same land. Um, so uh, there's no question that we're not running out of wheat. Your bread is safe. Uh, that you know, there's yeah, there you go. There's uh, uh, what you see there is just like every crop. There's seasonal. There's yearly ups and downs depending on a lot, variety of factors. But yields and production are generally up. We are no, in no danger of uh, uh, running short of wheat. To me, yep. this is a this is a very tricky seed because both of these claims are very easily verifiably false yeah. just by looking at publicly available data. So this yep. is a hard one for me. Um, in terms of the wheat yields, I think Sterling said it all. There isn't a whole lot left to add. Right. Now, the extreme weather side of it, you know, is is very common and very predictable in the media. The extreme weather side is. Anything out of the ordinary happens. We get uh, hail, uh, we get winds, we get tornadoes, we get hurricanes, we get lightning, we get extra thunderstorms, we get flooding, we get drought. Anything becomes a media focus, and they turn that into, you know, climate change is causing this. Without actually doing any research whatsoever, they just automatically go to it. And it's it's easily debunked. Even the IPP, IPCC says that there's no discernible trends, you know, in things like droughts. There's no discernible trends in flooding. They don't see any discernible trends in tornadoes or hurricanes. The data just doesn't support it. And so this is super easy to debunk, and we do it on a regular basis at Climate Realism. Sometimes in the spring and in the summer, it's, it's almost a daily occurrence that we have to deal with some of these idiotic stories where they're claiming extreme weather is getting worse because of climate change. And they won't even bother to look at the IPCC to, uh, to verify what they think about it. They just simply go with it. You know? I, think, I think this is a less tricky bracket, and I'll tell you why. So we showed the graphic of the wheat, right? 
uh, it, up, up, up. Yeah, that dips, 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 but general large and growing trend. Um, you pick your extreme weather event over time. Are they going up, up, up? No, but are they basically yeah. almost flat? Some of them declining, some of them a little up. I mean, the IPC says two types of droughts are increasing. They say uh, extreme rain is increasing, but not flooding. So it's like it's a mixed bag there. But even where it's not increasing, it's also not, you know, it's, it's basically flat or pretty close to flat. Whereas the wheat it's just way up. Well, yeah. Look, well, I think the most hurricane. annoying thing about the extreme weather claims are that, you know, they'll they'll box in their claim. They'll say something in the headline that'll say, you know, hurricanes getting more extreme with climate change. But then they'll be really specific in the actual content of the article or they try to cage it in, you know, they've been up for the last 20 years or whatever, even though that's right. not true. But they'll try to box it in with giving a very specific um, area of claim. I think recently the, um, what was it? Uh, the drought claims have been pretty strong in that, in that area where they will say drought is getting worse. And then you show them long-term data that shows the drought is not getting worse. And then they'll say, yeah, but in this very specific region of the world, in this particular time frame, usually starting, you know, post satellite record, um, mm -hmm. we can see that it's worse. Well, well actually usually starting post 2017 when we had some of the lowest drought ever. Yeah. And say, oh, well, it's, it's really gone up in the last five years. Uh, uh, yeah. So, Texas yeah. has tornado warnings. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, welcome to my world every year. Yeah. Well, so guys, it, it, it seems that it seems that the the chat overwhelmingly picks extreme weather, and I think it's and I think that's the right call because you know you see it every time. It's like you only hear a story here and there about the wheat yields all or right. agriculture and all that stuff, but extreme weather uh, is every time. It's like it's constant in the thing. So we're going to go with extreme weather and upset all a right. nine seed over an eight seed. But it's not the biggest myth. <laughs> well, take it up <laughs> in the next round, Sterling. I'm not going to win any of these, I suspect. Uh, you're, well, your 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 bracket is busted. That's all we got to say about that. Uh, so now, next we have, <laughs> next we have uh, the the hurricanes. Every time uh, the, the the idea, of course, famously in Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, that uh, global warming caused by humanity is going to make hurricanes more frequent and stronger and cause more disasters. And then something a little bit more niche as the 12 seed is the idea that human caused climate change is going to make uh, wine. Maybe not a thing of the past, but a lot more expensive because wine production is going to suffer because, I don't know, because it's getting warmer or colder. Who knows? So, guys, take it away. Uh, why don't you start with hurricanes, uh, Anthony? That's one of your things in your wheelhouse. Okay. But before I talk about hurricanes, I want to talk about hurricane parties. So, because of hurricane parties, is wine production up? <laughs> oh, maybe. Oh, where's Hi. the rim shot? Yeah. So hurricanes, you know, here's our climate at a glance on hurricanes. Now, this is one of the most easily debunked things uh, because the data, we have long-term data on hurricanes and not only does the long-term data show there's been no increase in hurricanes, even though it's been predicted, um, the, the IPCC came out and said, no, there's no increase in hurricanes. We don't see it in the data. Um, it, the, the fact is, is that right after 2005, after Hurricane Katrina, Al Gore and all of his ilk went out with big pronouncements in the media. You know, this is the new normal. Hurricanes are going to get worse. We have to solve climate change now. All of this stuff. And they're out there pushing this. And then guess what happened? We had a drought of hurricane impacts on the United States that lasted almost 11 years. No major hurricane made landfall in the United States. And it made them look like complete idiots. Right. And so, my vote my vote's actually going to go to wine production for this one. Despite the fact that the hurricane one is really easy to debunk and it's fun, um, wine production is also extremely easy to debunk. And it's actually um, counter to logic that they would say that a little bit of global warming is going to hurt the growing of grapes, where, you know, it's pretty obvious that the best places in the world for growing grapes are a bit closer to the equator than, um, 
you know, despite their efforts, somewhere like poor Canada, as we wrote an article on it, <laughs> climaterealism.com recently, um, you know, they're insistent on trying to grow uh, Mediterranean yeah, type Burgundy. species. Yeah. And it's just not going to, sorry, Ontario, it's, you're going to have a rough battle with that one. But if you would give up and try to grow, you know, like a German strain of some ice kind wines, of, uh, you know, wines. an ice vine, yeah, then you would do a lot better. But, you know, it depends. So I, my vote goes to wine production for this one. Yeah. Well, you know, the I'm, thing is, is that not everybody drinks wine. You know, some people are all gonna, about beer or whatever. And so, you know, it may not be as scary to as many people that wine production may be impacted by global warming. And some people like her to, like to drink hurricanes. And uh, <laughs> look, uh, so wine, wine production does nothing uh, for me. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, the far the more far reaching claim is, is certainly hurricanes. It affects more people uh, and more dangerously. Look, if, if, if you had to give up wine or if you could only drink uh, warmer wines, I think, you know, the world would not uh, collapse. But if if hurricanes got a lot worse uh, and really started slamming coasts and going in farther inland, say, and dumping more water, that could be a dangerous thing. Fortunately, like Linnea said, they're both easily refuted. Um, but the hurricane, I think, is more far reaching. I'm going to I'm going to vote for it. It's OK. Also so let's let's close line. out this close out this particular one. And vote and let us know what you think and we'll choose. But right now it looks like to me, hurricanes is the clear winner, whether you're drinking it or experiencing it. <laughs> All right. Feedback loops and polar bears. Yeah, that's a, that's something. I think that's uh, an easy one. I think that's an easy one. Yeah, most, people right. don't know, most people don't know anything about feedback loops. They well, they've right. heard the term if they heard them at all. But here's polar a good, bears, here's, they see all the time. But here's a good chance to talk about the feedback loops. I think this that's why I put it in here. And it's the idea that uh, human caused global warming, uh, that that uh, the feedback loops keep accelerating the warming. That's why they that's why they say that the um, you know the ice caps are going to melt. And I just saw a clip on this yesterday. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that if we lose the ice caps, if we lose the polar ice caps, the water in New York City will be up to the elbow of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. He literally yeah. said that on CM, on MSNBC a few years back. And so it's this idea that uh, the feedback loops are accelerating will make things worse. So, you know, Anthony, maybe you could start talking about how that is nonsense. Well, feedback loops have been, they've been looking for feedback loops ever since the whole global warming issue was raised. And the problem is they, they can't really find them definitively. They think they find them, they write papers about them, but the bottom line is, is that uh, science just recently, and I think we've got that uh, somewhere on our climate at a glance page, but science recently looked for water vapor in the atmosphere, which is the major feedback loop. Everything else is kind of inconsequential compared to water vapor in the atmosphere in terms of the greenhouse effect. And so the idea is, is that warmer temperatures is going to cause more evaporation from the oceans and the lakes and everything else. And it's going to increase the water vapor in the air and get into a feedback loop. Now, here's the very most interesting thing. A friend of mine, Forrest K. Mims, some of you may recognize his name from Electronics, Radio Shack, and all of that, did a 30-year study looking at atmospheric water vapor in the upper atmosphere using an interesting and inexpensive optical device that he designed. And even that optical device was so good that even NASA has adopted it. And they've looked at it and they said, yeah, it's real. He wrote a peer-reviewed paper last year published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society that showed, at least at his place in central Texas, there has been no increase in water vapor in the atmosphere whatsoever after 30 years. In fact, it even went down a little bit. So go figure. Feedback loop, not there. Yeah, and, and of course, water vapor may be the most important, but it's not the only one. They, they, where feedback loops come into play is in climate model projections. One of the reasons climate models regularly, almost universally overstate the amount of warming we should expect or can expect or have seen uh, due to, glo due to uh, C you know, CO2 emissions is the feedback loops. When you take the feedback, the supposed feedback loops, like uh, the, uh, 
the darkening of uh, the poles due to soot falling on them, so they, they warm up, or the permafrost melting, releasing more methane, or you know, pick your feedback loop. Uh, when you take all those out, you get pretty close to the warming we've actually experienced. And the, the feedback loops are just pure ass assertions and assumptions built into climate models. As Anthony said, we're not observing happening what they say should be happening when they build it into models. And the models run too hot. And the large, uh, the, the main reason why that is, is because they incorporate all these assumed feed feedback loops that no one has verified anywhere. Yep. So... Well, well, you got any input on feedback loops or, or well, polar bears? Just that, just that the feedback loops thing is what feeds the runaway warming uh, idea, right? And then the polar bears, though, man, that's a tough one because they are the poster child, literally. Uh, they have been yeah. my entire life. Um, but uh, in terms of the most annoying and persistent ones, you know, we all know polar bear numbers have been rising pretty steadily since they started controlling over hunting. Um, they seem to be doing just fine. Ooh, I think, I think I'm going to have to go with the chat and say feedback loops. I'm yeah. going I'm go to, right. I'm going to go with polar bears and I'll tell you why they move more people. I'm sorry. No one in Congress is testifying about feedback loops, but they're going there and testifying about polar bears and they're showing polar bears on TV and they're, generating kids concerns with polar bears and that's what drives legislation not some esoteric uh discussion in an academic journal or a model input about feedback loops now yeah the other thing about feedback loops is that's something we just don't know feedback loops may turn out to have an effect they just haven't so far but what we can definitely say is polar bears haven't declined show no no evidence they're declining and when you start talking about net primary productivity, which is the food for polar bears, there's no reason they should decline. Yeah. So I'm going to vote for polar bears as well. And here's why. They are the biggest moneymaker for climate change out there. They are the poster child. They are the sad pictures. They, you know, the, remember the starving polar bear video? Oh, gosh. You know, it wasn't even related to climate change. The, the poor thing had a disease. But that was exploited to get donations. And so in terms of the biggest myth, easily most debunked and the most far reaching, I vote for polar bears. I'm going to have to also vote for polar bears. This is close. Polar bears hits a three pointer from 30 feet at the buzzer for the win. <laughs> <laughs> I won a bracket. I, I won a bracket. Congrats. <laughs> you, won, you won one pick. Congratulations. <laughs> no, I think All I right. got hurricanes too, but... Uh... Yeah. We, this, okay. So here's another, this might also be an upset. Um, so the, so temps rising just means that, uh, you know, the global, global temperatures are rising. Although we do see from the data um, that for, I think from 2005, Anthony, that uh, if you just drew a, a line in the graph of temperatures taken from satellite data, it's generally flat. And yeah. It's, there is a rise in satellite data. It's a, it's a small rise compared small rise, to right. the surface temperature data set. And the most compelling graphic that we have is from the USCRN, the Climate Reference Network in the United States, which shows essentially no warming of any significance whatsoever from 2005 to present. And this is a perfectly cited, you know, I've done, gone and done my surveys of all the stations around, not all of them, but many of them around the United States. And basically what I've been able to show is that there's a lot of UHI pollution, a lot of local effect pollution associated with measuring the surface temperature. And so, although it's easy to debunk the fact that the surface temperature has been rising you know, rapidly to the point where they're making panic and alarm about it, they still hold on to it. They will not let go of that garbage temperature data that's so badly polluted. And so eh, it's kind of hard to, to demyth that one because nobody wants to accept what we show. They just don't like it because, well, it's contrary to the models or and contrary to the, the, the um, meme and everything else they just don't want to talk about it so they keep pushing it yeah i think so not based on the um surface data measurements uh, i think the satellite record does you know show that there is some warming it doesn't seem to be nearly as you know hockey stick scary as um 
some of the modeling shows, of course. But I think it makes sense to assume, even if we didn't have modern current measurements, that there would be some warming going on because we were just in a major glacial period. I would be much more concerned if we were not seeing any warming at all or if we were seeing another uh, backward slide into colder temperatures overall. That's a lot more alarming to me than uh, a little bit of warming af after the Little Ice Age. Well, well so we, now we have coffee yeah. production. Well, right. So it's the idea that global warming caused by humans is going to is uh, is making it harder to produce coffee beans for some reasons. And uh, I know we've debunked that on the climate realism site at least four times. So let's right. talk about that myth. And I'm about to debunk it again because I'm writing something about it today. Um, <laughs> you know, few people care more about coffee uh, than me. Um, oh, yeah. Well, we all got our <laughs> cups. Um, Linnea, where's your coffee? <laughs> oh, I'm drinking tea today. Sri Lanka oh, is my, uh, my favorite yeah. country right now. <laughs> a, a communist. Someone who wants to go back to Britain. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, but coffee is so it's so easily debunked. I mean, it's it's really easily debunked. And as much as it affects me and evidently uh, some of the rest of us on this call, uh, probably a lot of us, the temperature thing, I think, is the bigger thing. It should be noted that the temperature, uh, you know, like, look, the land base says an increase, even in the best uh, data source, the USCRN. Uh, the satellites show a modest increase and we never talk about them, but the weather balloons, we've been using those a lot longer than satellites and they show a modest increase. So uh, temps are increasing, just not rising at a rapid and dangerous rate. There's no evidence of that. Coffee, it's not even decreasing. <laughs> it's, it's, they say it's going downhill. They point to isolated areas where coffee production has collapsed. It's largely because they can't compete in the marketplace. Um, uh, some, some places in Mexico aren't growing as much coffee as they used to, but what they did was they went from mass production of normal, you know, of either Robusto, Robusto or Arabica coffee to, uh, organic certified production. So, so their, uh, absolute amounts fail, fell, I said fail, fell. But uh, the profits they're making, the, the margin of profit on their, their coffee production has increased. The, the, fact, the fact is very clear that coffee production is increasing amid a modest warming, which you would expect because coffee's not grown in the Arctic. <laughs> they don't grow. No, no, that's coffee. all the cold coffee they're serving at Starbucks yeah. now. They don't, they don't grow a lot of coffee in New Zealand or Australia or the bottom of Chile uh, they grow it around the equator and, and closer there. Warm temperatures are good for coffee. Moisture yeah. is, is good for coffee. Um, aridity, uh, desertification, not so much. All right, so let's vote. Let's see what's the bigger myth. Is it temperatures are rising or coffee production? Which one is the bigger myth most easily debunked? Uh, it's a tough one. What do you think, uh, Anthony? What's your vote? What's that? What's your vote, Anthony? Um, in terms of being the most easily debunked, well, I'm going to go with temperatures rising, mainly because it's near and dear to my heart. I've spent the last 15 years trying to debunk it, but I can't seem to get anybody at NOAA or NASA or any of those places to listen. All they want to do is cite computer models and say, they're, well, you know, the data that we've produced is accurate, so just shut up. Sterling, coffee? Uh, yeah, because temperatures are rising, just not catastrophically, even though I think the temperature rising claim is uh, the more dangerous of the two. All right. I'm going to go coffee. Because of the, uh, like Sterling just said, the dangerous rise is, you know, the kind of crux of their argument at this point, I would, I would go with temperatures rising. Well, looks like we have a consensus. Uh, the most dangerous thing in the world is Anthony Watts with a soundboard. Okay. It looks it looks like the audience was pretty split on it as well. They were pretty split. We'll go with temperature rising. Because one is real easy refuted. 
Right. Well, we can talk about it again in the next round. Uh, All right. And so, and so here we go. So this is actually pretty interesting, and it is the <laughs> <laughs> it is the idea. I think this. I don't think this is going to be upset. In fact, I even said before the podcast, I think Greta as a six seed is vastly underseeded. She probably should have How taken the place you? of polar bears. Of course, of course. But she uh, she may get her revenge here. And so uh, the eleven seed is climate um, PTSD. Uh, I know that seems kind of vague. But uh, we have a story here, and Linnea, you wrote it. It's from January 25th. Yeah. I'm going to share it in the, in the chat with, uh, with Anthony. He can bring it up on the screen. And the headline of it is wrong, mainstream media. Climate change is not causing PTSD. Now, now uh, Linnea, I, I've been told by the media, and actually I tend to find it believable that America's youth are suffering from uh, climate PTSD and because we seem to hear it all the time. We see stories about how people think. I, I remember seeing a, a, a sign actually held up at a rally. It was a, from, a, from a, a while ago. But the sign said, you will die of old age and we will die of climate change. Uh, so, yeah. No, I'm, is that funny? But all right. I don't know. It's <laughs> um, kind of funny. So, so, Linnea, so Linnea, tell me about that. My vote. Okay. So right away, I'm going to be the upset. I vote for climate PTSD right away because... I think that this is one of the most insidious um, lines of argument that they that the alarmist side has come up with, because it is not climate change itself that is causing PTSD. It is not climate change itself. It is not extreme weather events that are psychologically traumatizing children. It is the climate alarmist narrative that is traumatizing kids. It is being told since you are in middle school or elementary school that there is an impending end of the world coming because of your use of fossil fuel technologies. Um, that is what is t traumatizing and terrifying kids. And in this article that I wrote, it was about, um, there was a study that said that climate change trauma is causing uh, real impacts on the brain. And what they did was they interviewed a bunch of people who had witnessed a, uh, their homes being destroyed by wildfire. And they called that trauma climate trauma. No, it's you just were struck by a natural disaster trauma. It's it's so insidious and, and they can use this argument to push basically anything they want. But it's their policies and their narrative that is causing it in the first place. That's my argument. That's pretty compelling. And I yes, yeah, no, she's 100 percent correct. I've written about this um on multiple times, it wasn't just PTSD. You know, look, you have a whole new branch of psycho psychological psychology, eco psychology, where they're treating people who are depressed because of the state of the earth. And it's not because of the state of the earth. It's because of what they're being told the state of the earth is, what they're hearing every day. If they go outside in nature, they'll find that it's abundant during the summer and spring. It's green. Uh, there are birds singing. There are squirrels everywhere. Uh, species are doing well. If they, th their experience would be nature's a wonderful thing. What they're being told is it's being destroyed. And to be fair, uh, Abel Windsor wrote this, and I was thinking it myself. Um, Greta is a symptom of climate PTSD. Not, I don't know if I'd just call it PTSD, but it's it. She's a symptom of the depression and the angst that is being generated by all the media uh, hype and falsehoods and lies that they are telling about climate change. They're making a generation of, of, of kids fear for their future, to, to reject having children, um, which is their choice. But if they do it because they think the world is going to end, they're not being well informed. Yeah. So and Greta, uh, I just uh, I think she's actually a symptom of it. I don't think it's a, a competition between them. I think she is part of the PTS. OK, so yeah. I'll weigh in and, and say I, you know, Greta. Well, she is well, every time she opens her mouth, she is self debunking and the things that she says. How dare you? Right. Yeah. And so yeah, you're right. She's a symptom of climate PTSD. Climate PTSD is the over lying cause of all of this uh, or, or it's the symptom the cause of these symptoms and so i think that's the bigger myth um and it's been created entirely by the media and activists and greta is just simply 
uh, riding on the coattails of that. So she's pretty much completely insignificant in terms of things. So I vote for climate PTSD. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, because Greta's star was already fading, and that's why she started getting involved in, you know, shoving herself in front of cameras again um, at protests and stuff. I think that um, the after her initial UN speech, they were happy to bring her on the circuit, send her on a nice sailing trip across the Atlantic, um, you know, drag her around to all the media circus. And then they were like, OK, you're done. Uh, but she's trying to force herself back into it. And I actually, despite the fact that she's still making the news, she's mostly making the news because the right kind of is elevating her because of how nonsensical, you know, and irrelevant her arguments are. Um, I think that if we stopped talking about her, she would probably disappear entirely. All right. How dare you? <laughs> Goodbye, Greta. <laughs> so long. What an upset. What an upset. And it wasn't even very close. I'm really surprised by that. All right. Moving on. We have the number seven seed sea level rise versus the number 10 seed ocean acidification. Uh, Anthony, we'll start with you again. So the, the claim, the myth is that uh, sea level rise is accelerating, it's uh, alarming. And as I said, uh, uh, as Neil deGrasse Tyson said, soon the water will be up to the elbow of the Statue of Liberty. So why don't you talk a little bit about the myth of sea level rise? Well, actually, I'd like to talk about ocean acidification because there's okay. something that most people don't know about ocean acidification. There is the claim that the oceans have gotten more acidic since about 1850. And, and this was done by a paper out of uh, the National Center of Atmospheric Research, Kevin Trenberth, who published this paper. The paper didn't actually measure any ocean acidification over that period. It was a model. They estimated it. And then the, the media, being dumb, just simply says, oh, the model says, and they run with it as if it's factual. There's just no evidence, zero evidence of ocean acidification occurring. And the other, of course, big thing is the fact that it's not really acidic. It's getting less alkaline. It's moving towards being acidic, but it's not even close yet. So the whole thing is just generally nothing but a fabrication. That's my view on it. I think ocean acidification is the biggest fabrication about climate out there because it's never been measured actually. And there doesn't seem to be any real issues with what's going on. You know, there's these studies that say, oh, there was this one study a couple of years ago that we debunked that, you know, they put these fish in a tank, you know, at this marine institute. And then they pump carbon dioxide in there, you know, and, oh, goodness, the fish are dying. Oh, no. Well, duh, that's not the ocean. That's a closed environment where you're forcing the issue. So I think it's just the biggest load of garbage out there. Must have been a super high CO2 concentration, too, because uh, as people who keep aquariums, especially planted aquariums, know, um, there's an entire industry around CO2 injection into planted aquariums to get your plants to grow better so that your fish have <laughs> right. a nicer environment to live in. So I can only imagine what the concentrations must have been. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How aesthetic is it? Yeah. You know, I, I'm, 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 I think I'm with Anthony on this. Um, the ocean acidification thing, you know, it's it's dangerous. Sea level rise is dangerous. Sea level rise is happening. My suspicion is it will continue to happen in, until the next ice age come. That's what's happened in during previous interglacials, the evidence is. Um, it's not accelerating, uh, though in some places it's worse than others due to uh, land subsidence and some other development issues. But the ocean acidification is dangerous if it were true, because, uh, you know, it would wipe out uh, it, 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 if it became acidic, it would wipe out uh, some coral, maybe all coral. It would hurt shellfish. It would uh, affect algae and phytoplankton. So it, it would make the seas, uh, you know, life would be much less abundant. And the seas are you know, everyone thinks the forest are the, uh, the lungs of the world. They're not. The seas are. Um, so um, I think that is both the clearest of the two lies as a lie um, and uh, in some sense, the more dangerous. All right. I don't see a consensus on the uh, in the chat on to which one of this is which one of these is the most uh, annoying and persistent climate myth. So uh, 
Anthony, you vote for ocean acidification, I, I presume. Right, I do. Uh, Sterling, you're going to go with uh, sea level rise myth. No, no. I'm no, going you're going with acidification too. All right. Yeah. And uh, Linnea? I'm going to go with ocean acidification as well, even though sea level rise is a more effective fear tool. Yeah. Because people are afraid of their homes getting drowned out and stuff. And yet population growth on the coast is higher than anywhere else. So I, okay. as I sit in Rowlett, Texas, I fear ocean sea level rise not a bit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> All right. So moving on, we're going to go to uh, the number two seed, Michael Mann's famous hockey stick and uh, how people believe that and treat it as real science versus the number 15 seed tornadoes, meaning that uh, tornadic activity is increasing um, they're almost exclusively to the United States because of human caused climate change. Uh, Anthony, I think you can pick which one of these you'd like to talk about. I would be um, very surprised if tornadoes beat out Michael Mann's hockey stick. Well, you know, I can talk about both of them with, uh, I could spend an hour talking about both of these things, but we don't have an hour. But I will say this, I used to chase tornadoes. I used to work with, uh, at Purdue University. Uh, we actually produced a, that, the thing called the TOTO, the Totable Tornado Observatory, which was we set out uh, hoping tornadoes would run over it. It was the basis for the movie uh, Twister. Anyway, mm -hmm. bottom line is that tornadoes are not increasing. They have not been increasing whatsoever. There's no data supporting this. And the IPCC admits this. The reason that tornadoes are perceived to be a climate change driven increase is because of reporting. We have people running around, you know, with cell phone cameras and pocket radar on their phones and, uh, you know, all kinds of electronic reporting, uh, storm chasing systems, you know, even from space, we can look at more severe weather than we used to be able to. So the ability to detect and report on tornadoes has dramatically increased since I started doing weather over 35 years ago. So I think tornadoes is the most easy to debunk. Michael Mann is also kind of like Greta. He is self debunking. If you ever will look at his his Twitter feed. I mean, the guy is off the rails on a regular basis. And, you know, only the really deranged level of people out there take him seriously anymore. Yeah, well, yeah, I have to I have to uh, actually log out of Twitter to look at his Twitter feed because he's blocked me as he has probably you and everybody he's else. He's the blocker too. in chief. There it is. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, Sterling, I'm going to ask you to talk about uh, the hockey stick. I mean, this is, um, you know, we, we, it's kind of a loose, we're kind of going loose with the rules here, but I just put in the chat that, you know, people should be voting for their most annoying, your favorite, most persistent myth or fraud. And in my opinion, this is the fraud that started it all. And, uh, you know, so to me, this is a pretty easy one. Um, I agree with you that that, you know, the hockey stick and polar bears started it all. I think those two things have driven so much uh, of the angst uh, surrounded. And, and, and the hockey stick, of course, was the one that, that when it started, it started by the IPCC when they adopted it. They didn't think, they didn't think that through because they, they sort of backed off of it under criticism uh, pretty quickly. It, it didn't show up in, in future reports. Um, so I, I think it's been thoroughly de debunked. You knew it was created using proxy data, but selected proxy data. They chose some trees, but not other trees nearby uh, because they didn't show the same thing. They, they did sample them, but because they didn't show the same thing, they dropped them. Uh, it created an artificial curve. Uh, it ignored uh, history. It's, it basically wrote out of history the little ice age mm -hmm. and uh, previous ice ages and warm periods. Uh, so, it, you know, it was just really, really bad science. It was debunked uh, through, uh, you know, statistical and mathematical analysis. Uh, it still lingers. Uh, they still try and defend it. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's largely, uh, I, I'd, well, I'd like to think it was irrelevant in the debate, but I know that it is not. So I don't know what to say there. Uh, tornadoes. Honestly, I don't see the IPCC or anybody saying much that tornadoes um, are uh, a, a real reflective of climate change. Um, maybe the odd news story does, but, you know, the IPCC is very clear that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, the data is very clear that it hasn't increased. 
uh, either either number or strength. When they occur, we had one, you know, a few miles from me last night. Uh, we we get them. I, I've lived with tornadoes my whole life. Even when I when I fled when I when I went let left Texas and went to graduate school in Ohio, tornadoes followed me because Ohio's also in the tornado belt. Sure. So I've lived with them. Uh, they're bad. <laughs> no one wants a tornado visiting. Uh, it's it's worse than the in-laws. Um, but um, I really don't think that there's m- m- there are many people who really make a connection between tornadoes and climate change. So I don't think that's a substantive myth. I mean, there's a good reason it's ranked 15th, right? In your bracket. That's right. Mm-hmm. I, I think the, I think the hockey stick is the more persistent uh, and dangerous myth. Would you agree, Linnea? We can move on yep. to the next round. A hockey stick. When you talk to a lay person who's super into the climate change narrative, uh, but doesn't actually follow any of the science except for what you know media headlines say. The first thing they do is they send you a graph of the hockey stick. Right. So it is still annoying. Yes. Well, it looks like maybe the hockey stick as a two seed has a chance to take it all. Well, go but now. Now we are in the elite eight, everyone, and we are going to run a little long on this podcast. But um, uh, now we can just, I guess, compare the consensus versus extreme weather which which of these do you guys think is the most annoying persistent uh myth that really needs to be busted for public consumption i'm gonna go with consensus because first of all it doesn't exist secondly it was fabricated and thirdly it just become like um it's just the same thing again and again and again they never learn anything new from it they just parrot it it is annoying as hell all right. Um, I pick extreme weather because I think it's the uh, narrative that although it's easy to debunk, it is easy for the media to use more, even more so than the consensus. I think it's way easier for them to show a big blizzard or a big drought and say, look here, this is proof of climate change. And people who, you know, don't feel like spending the time to think critically or can't think critically about it will mm-hmm. fall for it every time. That's a good point. Sterling, anything uh, to say? Well, yeah, I think extreme weather is the more dangerous one and the, and the, and the, the most easily refuted to me. Consensus is the most annoying one because science, I, I wouldn't care if there was a consensus. I mean, if, if it was a hundred percent, but one uh, laggard, you know, so 99.99%, uh, I wouldn't care because science isn't moved forward by consensus. One person can be right and everybody else can be wrong. And if he shows it with the data, uh, you know, then then the consensus doesn't matter. We don't have uh, we, we used to have a consensus about humors in the body causing disease. They don't. Uh, you know, we used to have a consensus that the, the earth was the center of the universe. It's not. Uh, you, you can refute consensus time and again. That's not science. It annoys yeah. me, but I think the extreme weather is the more dangerous of the two. And that's the one we get hammered with uh, every year right. seasonally. That's well, true. So what's the vote? I, I th- Well, the chat is really very heavy on consensus and I, mm. I would have to agree with them, you know, because when you, when we present the data at our climate conferences, for instance, or at climate realism or climate at a glance.com, they say, yes, but not, you know, but, you know, you guys are the outliers, you know, 97% of scientists agree that humans are causing a problem. So with that and the chat consensus moves on to the next round. (laughs) And now we have, uh, uh, we have my favorite uh, polar bears, uh, which, uh, which made it uh, versus the idea that hurricanes are getting stronger and more dangerous because of human caused climate change or that humans are causing the death uh, and soon extinction of polar bears. Uh, Comparing these two, which which would be your most annoying and needs to be debunked myth? Okay, between these two, I pick polar bears because of the iconic nature of them, and because at least for the hurricanes, the National Hurricane Center tends to take our side on the on alarm uh, perspective. They tend to kind of tamp it down a bit when they go on the news, even if their information is taken out of context and used for. Uh, the alarmist perspective, I think that we have a little bit more support on the idea that hurricanes aren't increasing um, from places that you would consider the mainstream versus the polar bear thing, which despite all the clear data showing that they're increasing, they are still, every time you see a news article about them or about climate change, it's a picture of a darn polar bear. So, 
Yeah, I'm going to have to go with polar bears as well. It's the most one of the most annoying myths out there. It's right up there with Michael Mann's hockey stick and consensus. And I will point out that hurricanes didn't become a thing until Al Gore and Katrina in 2005. That's when it really took off. And polar bears had been cited well before that. Uh, so I think polar bears is the most persistent and annoying myth. I thought Anthony would be with me on this, but he's not. Uh, I'm going to go with hurricanes. It seems I'm the minority, though I don't know about the comments. Um, and the reason is this. I really think polar bears are going to debunk themselves. I've seen them try and find new iconic species to talk about because the polar bears just aren't playing the game right. Their numbers <laughs> keep increasing. And uh, so they, 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 they didn't talk about honeybees 30 years ago. They didn't mm. talk about uh, uh, coral 30 years ago. They didn't talk about all sorts of species. It's only after the polar bears started to wane as an attractive uh, target when the, the numbers kept hammering them that other species came into play. Butterflies. Oh, there's a, there's a species we all care about, right? Whereas we'll never debunk hurricanes because hurricanes are going to happen every season. And, uh, and every season when they do, somebody somewhere is going to attribute it to climate change until the myth itself of climate change is debunked. So I'm going with my, hurricane. My counterpoint to that, Sterling, is that now what they've done is they've started talking about how polar bears are having more encounters with people because of climate change. So they're like eating people more often or whatever. Uh, yeah, I agree that they're reporting that, but I'm not convinced it is more often. I am convinced that polar bear numbers are increasing so much <laughs> around populations that are also increasing so much the the, the villages are, have doubled in size some of these villages uh that when you have more polar bears and more people together polar bears being one of the few species that actually hunts humans uh i think tigers are the other one that's known to actually stalk and hunt humans um right so you know I, once again i think that can e be easily debunked though i'm seeing the stories you're right yeah, we had a story on climate realism just a couple of months ago about a polar bear attack in uh, far northern reaches. And basically the media went out and immediately blamed it on climate change. And of course, there was just absolutely nothing to support it. It was just I, I wrote that, I wrote that story and I pointed out that polar bear populations had, in the region had increased. They were having more live births, uh, larger litters, and more people were living there. That's the size right. of that village had doubled. So right. um, I really think they're going to debunk themselves, but uh, I may be in the minority. I think yeah. you are. Right. In the minority. Let's vote. We're going to vote for polar bears. They slash the face of the hurricanes and they laugh in the face of the wind. All right. <laughs> we go to number three. The temperatures are rising in, uh, in ways that are very dangerous to people. And climate PTSD as the number 11 seed. I think maybe we have a, a, an upset and the, the number 11 seed may move on. Uh, of these two myths, I'm going to go with you, Linnea, since you made the best case yet for the climate PTSD. Which yeah. of these do you think is best? This one is hard. Um, boy, I'm going to have to think about this one for a minute. Skip me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, who would like to make the case for uh, the temperatures rising is uh, TM Willemsa, one of our many viewers or our regular viewers votes for that one. I think temperature rising is going to be around. Uh, I don't think we're, we're ever going to get rid of that unless temperatures stop rising, whether it's a modest amount or a large amount. Uh, climate PTSD, I actually think, is uh, one of the most dangerous aspects of the whole climate debate. I mean, one of the most dangerous impacts. I think that climate PTSD is worse than sea level rise. It's worse than uh, polar bears going extinct. This is, we are, we are literally destroying uh, a generation of kids. We're, we're destroying them mentally. And I think that's awful. So I think it's a much more dangerous thing than temperatures, which I think are going to continue to rise regardless of what we do until the next ice age comes. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with climate PTSD as well. Although temperatures rising as a subject near and dear to my heart, it, like you say, Sterling, it's going to be around for a while. It's been around for a while. It's the whole thing that kicked this off back in 1988 in June with Dr. James Hanson talking to you know, Congress about the models and so forth. It, 
they, it's not going to go away. It's, and it's not easily debunked because no one really wants to look at the data. But climate PTSD really is far more dangerous and it affects people more. So that's my vote. Hard to disagree with that. I think that's probably right. All right. Wow. An upset. You know, many about 20 years ago, George Mason University made it all the way to the final four, I believe, as a 10 seed or maybe a, an 11 seed. So we may be seeing uh, history repeat itself in our fun little game here. All right, you guys. So you, you predicted that, Jim. So good for you. Yeah, good for me. Yes. Your all brackets right. are doing well. <laughs> all right. Let's move on. We have ocean acidification versus Michael Mann's hockey stick. Which is the myth that needs to be debunked the most? Uh, hockey stick is still way more annoying than ocean acidification to me, even though the ocean is not acid. I just, the hockey stick thing is, uh, persistent regardless of what the actual, um, even on the alarmist side that their science no longer supports the hockey stick. Um, and yet it still makes it into mainstream conversation. So that's my vote. Yeah. You know, I don't think ocean acidification really gets a lot of traction, with people mainly because, well, you know, people aren't going to the beach and dissolving on a regular basis. It just doesn't happen. So. <laughs> well, they don't, they don't, they don't come out of the ocean with their trunks uh, naked with their face melting. Yeah. 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 You're right. But people believe the hockey stick because they don't have the wherewithal to debunk it themselves. And so I think it is the most dangerous and most annoying. We are definitely going to go with the hockey stick then. So now we are at the final four, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a uh, the one seed, the four seed, the 11 seed, and the two seed have advanced. So among the matchup between the consensus, the one seed, and the polar bears, the four seed, which of these uh, you know, myths, which of these memes, which of these stories that the people believe uh, is, is most important to debunk, which is most annoying to you? Which one would you like to see move on to the finals? Hmm. You know, folks, we need some votes here in the comments to help us out here, because this is a tough choice. Um, it's supposed you know, to get tougher as we go along. Yeah, the <laughs> bears. Anyway. Um, <laughs> the bears, yeah. <laughs> consensus is tough. You know, it's everywhere in virtually every article. You know, they're talking about whatever it is, talking about tornadoes, hurricanes, you know. Consensus seems to make its way into every article. Polar bears tend to stand on its own only when there's something about polar bears. And so I would say consensus gets more traction with the media out there and with people than the polar bears do. But the polar bears is used to make more money and it holds its heartstrings. So I don't know, man. I, I'm, I'm having a real problem with this one. I, yeah. can't, I can't vote yet. I, I have to think some more. You think some I think more? I think this is where I think this is where Sterling's argument against the polar bears moving forward makes the most sense because the polar bears are self debunking. Um, they're, you know, cute. Um, they look good on posters and on advertisements and commercials and stuff, but uh, they've already kind of established themselves as the poster child. Whereas the consensus is another poster child in itself. And it is one that is, uh, dangerous, not just to the climate disagreement, um, but also the state, the status of science at large, I think. So I'm going to go with consensus on this one. No, well, I already said polar bears. I, I thought were, you know, Linnea mentioned are, are self debunking. I, I didn't think they should move, move through. Uh, so th this isn't a, a very hard one for me because consensus uh, is, is probably one of the top two myths that that we are that is used that they think debunks us right mm -hmm. right when we when we talk about climate change they come back with the hockey stick oh it's warming look or 97 percent of scientists say yep. i think i think those are the two stupidest of the uh of all the things in the bracket, I think they're the most idiotic and unscientific, but they are the ones that they use to debunk us the most. So I think consensus has to move on. And I would say that our most of the people in our chat would agree with that. So consensus makes the finals. <laughs> and now we have that that scrappy upstart climate PTSD versus Michael Mann and his mighty hockey stick. 
gosh, this is going to be a tough one. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, you Linnea, realize you, you've been going with Linnea. You've been going with Climate PTSD. You're the one. You, you coached that team to the next round, so maybe you need to start with this one if you think it's better than the hockey stick or needs to move on. Uh, it is a tough one because hockey stick is again an iconic um, child of this climate alarmism alarmism movement here. Um, but I, I don't think that it's as troublesome to the future of, you know, people being able to make good decisions as the PTSD issue is, because I think it is a real issue and it might not be literally post-traumatic stress disorder, but it is terror. And, um, the, the, entire goal of the climate alarmism side is to terrify the layperson badly enough into giving up basically all their freedoms. So I think I have to keep going with climate PTSD. I, I think the single biggest factor people should consider when they decide whether climate PTSD or hockey stick moves forward is that if hockey stick makes the finals, you know, Michael Mann will be bragging about this on his Twitter feed. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a great you point. You know, he will say, see, even they admit my hockey stick is the king. Uh, I, they, yeah, I, the, king, the king myth, the king BS, but yeah, well, sure. He'll oh. drop, in his post, he'll drop the myth and just say the hockey stick is one of the top two issues to debunk. Uh, you know, the, gosh. Yeah. So I don't know about this. I've always I've said from the you know pretty much the start that I think climate PTSD what we're doing to children is is just about the worst thing um, that's coming out of all of this. Um, it's the thing that is going to be the hardest to solve. We can we can build seawalls, we can harden infrastructure against hurricanes, um, we can we can you know we keep growing food so that's not an issue. Uh, but how we help children with their psychological problems, I honestly don't don't know maybe they just grow up and they find out we don't want to pay high energy prices <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we want a house and we want to drive a car maybe that solves itself over time i don't know uh but the hockey stick like i said in the previous segment it's the it's one of the two things that they use to so-called debunk us yeah, yeah it, it, it's one of the holy talisman of the uh, of the climate cult. You know, it's it's tough. Yeah. Let me let me let me make an argument here for the climate PTSD. Um, and I know I keep changing. It's my game. I can do this if I want to. I keep changing <laughs> the criteria as we move along. But the the idea of uh, climate of, of fighting against this myth and it's a, it's a young up and comer of climate PTSD. But I think I'm with Linnea on this. I think it's really and with you, Sterling. I think it's really important to fight the myth that humans are causing a climate catastrophe and it is disheartening and depressing an entire generation or two who have been told nothing uh, their entire life except that they are a plague upon the earth and those damn generations before them have damned them to disaster and they're not even having children. So I vote for actually for climate PTSD. Star yeah, sprink uh, Anthony? Sprinkle, some, right. sprinkle yeah. some insects, not sugar on your cereal. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get into that, let me talk about my thinking. I originally, I was going to vote for a hockey stick, but Sterling, you make an excellent point. Uh, Michael Mann will use this. I mean, that's what he does. He uses anything and everything to prove that he's right, even though science has proven him wrong. He even denies that science has proved him wrong. He's just, he's the ultimate denier, really. But PTSD is, as you point out, is the up and coming issue. And the hockey stick was the progenitor of PTSD. It basically caused PTSD because it, it, it terrified people when it first came out. Oh, my God, look at that. It's going straight up. We're doomed. But it's also old news. And so I'm going to change what I originally was going to say about hockey stick and go with PTSD. Well, that does it then. <laughs> that makes it very easy. That, uh, by the way, that's not just a consensus. That's uni unanimity. Yeah. Yes, this is that's that's quite the upset. And now we are actually now at the final. So we need to decide, uh, people in the chat and people on Climate Change Roundtable, what is the most important, most annoying myth that needs to be debunked so that the public uh, can better understand what's actually happening to the climate. Uh, again, we can kind of change the criteria, but of these two, number one seed consensus and number 11 seed 
defeating or debunking climate PTSD? <sighs> Toughy. Um, it is tough. The, there, the sparkle of hope for the climate PTSD issue is that eventually, because the predictions keep failing, my hope is, is that people will just kind of give up on being afraid of it because nothing ever materializes. Um, with the exception of food crisis type issues, because as we've discussed a lot on climate realism, um, any modern food crisis, is, especially if it's not regional, uh, seems to be largely in part because of climate policy pushing people towards more organic farming and that kind of thing. Um, so I like a food crisis is pretty much the only thing that I can think of that would reinforce the idea of climate PTSD over time. Uh, I would also say that the people of earlier generations who grew up with like, I don't know, um, the ozone scare or other issues don't seem to be quite as afraid of that anymore. So I kind of hope that people are able to grow out of it, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I would vote for on here because the consensus issue is the anti-science um, kind of pivot point for the entire argument. Uh, I'm not sure I'll have to <laughs> listen to some other input before I make my decision. Well, the, the chat's leaning pretty heavily toward consensus, and they point out that without the consensus, which kind of dr dr has been driving climate alarmism for 20, 30 years, we wouldn't have come to a pl place where we had climate PTSD. And so debunking um, you know, the myth of a consensus that all scientists, 97% scientists, agree with the climate cult, um, you know, that the chat at least is saying that that's kind of one of the, one of the root causes of climate PTSD, so they vote for consensus. Yeah, I vote for renaming PTSD in this context to post-temperature stupidity disorder because <laughs> no. it's all, you know, it's a hockey stick. You know, it was all about temperature and, and that's what drove the consensus. People, I will vote for climate PTSD because consensus does not scare people. It's used as an argument. See, I'm right and you're wrong, but consensus is evil in that, you know, it's wrong, it's not really there, but climate PTSD is even more evil because it scares people and they're using it as a tool to cause people to change their behavior when they don't need to at all. And yes, I agree, it may self-debunk at some point, Linnea, um, but you know, it's being used as the big hammer right now. And even though consensus is a hammer itself, I think climate PTSD is the biggest of all the hammers out there used by the media and the alarmist. I, I've said all along, I think climate PTSD is dangerous. I don't, uh, I don't, uh, it, look, it's an effect of all of this. And I think uh, someone said it best that, if, if we didn't have the so-called consensus, we probably wouldn't have climate PTSD. If we didn't have the belief that most scientists agree that humans are causing dangerous climate change and we didn't have that constantly hammered in the media, um, if, if, if people were speaking out and saying, no, that's, that's not true, we don't agree with this, then kids wouldn't be scared. Uh, they wouldn't think that the end is near. It's driven by the, the claim that Almost every scientist thinks this is true. And so, uh, though I think the PTSD is the worst impact, um, I think consensus is the most dangerous thing because unlike me and, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few scientists who actually say consensus doesn't matter in science, most people think it does. Yeah. Yeah, so I think yeah. consensus. I think that in the chat, I think was uh, maybe not overwhelmingly, but I think consensus was the was the was the choice of most people on the chat. So I think we have to declare now, once and for all, the champion of the climate myth uh, bracket and madness and climate madness is consensus. Uh, well, that was exhausting. My vote, my vote on PTSD is that. <laughs> Uh, but I do, I do think that that's a good argument for consensus being the winner because it is kind of the progenitor of all the rest of it. Um, yeah. Well, 
Well, and that Donnie was, is right. That consensus yeah. is a scientific issue and the PTSD is a societal issue. Uh, yeah. And I think that they can be addressed. They might even be able to be addressed separately in terms of solving it. Uh, but yeah, no, this is, it's probably, <laughs> probably the right way to go. Uh, but number 11, climate PTSD, man, Donnie, you're right. It's that, that old upset. And he just didn't make it in the end. Very sad. <laughs> Renee, you should be yeah. very proud of your team that you coached all the way to the finals. And, uh, I am. And a pretty handshake at midcourt. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so we lost Sterling. He disappeared off the feed. I don't know what happened. He um, we, uh, maybe, maybe the long arm of climate change reached out and smacked him. I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I would say that the most important revelation, ah, oh, there he is. He's back. The most important revelation out of this whole uh, session, this bracketing, is that Klein, uh, Greta, once again, has been proven irrelevant. How dare you? <laughs> I, I think the most important, I, for some reason I lost internet connection. I thought it was y'all that froze up first. Uh, I think the most important thing that's come out of this is that we, if, if I ever do a basketball bracket, I'm going to go to Jim for advice because he, <laughs> he, he picked consensus as number one, and guess what? It lasted through all the brackets, and it won. I, I take it, it we Decided that one at the end. I blanked it did, out. It, it did win. It was close. The chat was the deciding factor. They they leaned more toward consensus. But you know, hey, you know this. I thought this was fun. I you know maybe we'll do it again next year. But you know what's interesting about this bracketing is that none of us really you know knew how this was going to turn out. The chat was contributing. We were thinking these things through. And so you know my little trick or my little game of trying to think of ways to talk about sixteen different myths and crazy stuff about the climate. Uh, I think it worked out all right. I've never watched Game of Thrones. Maybe we should do one with Game of Thrones where we're each kingdom. and Ugh. That's something I even know less about than basketball. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sterling, this is, I thank you for letting me uh, Bigfoot on your show here. I'll let you close it out for us. Well, uh, Anthony, I guess. It out. Yeah. yeah, I guess that wraps up our show. You know, it was interesting and it was involved and engaged and a lot of fun. And I want to thank all of our panelists, and particularly Jim, for coming up with this idea. And uh, so, yes, climate consensus is the number one myth out there that needs to be debunked. So work on that, folks. Debunk it when you can. Thank you for joining us here on number 55 of Climate Change Roundtable. For James Likely, Sterling Burnett, and Linnea Lucan, I thank you for joining us. And I want to wish you a happy and, and prosperous weekend. And St. Patrick's Day.